Proverbs, and I'll tell you this, I have never spoken through the book of Proverbs, and it is a big book, and I was like, how do you take this daunting task? And uh, we are not going to go through every single verse, because I don't think any of us have that long of a lifespan, okay? But we are gonna, uh, we're going to go over a number of verses and a number of chapters, and uh, I'm looking forward to this, and I trust that the Lord would speak to our hearts through his word like he always does. It's not that, is God speaking? The question is not that, because God is speaking. The question is, are we hearing? Are we listening? Are we open? And if your heart is open, God will indeed speak to you, even this day. So I'm looking forward to what God would say to us. Now, this being the first message, I do have to do some background. And we're not just going to talk about the background of Proverbs, but I want you to be aware of various genres in Scripture. And one of those categories of Scripture is called wisdom literature. And Proverbs, of course, is a part of that. You have Proverbs, you have Job, and you have the book of Ecclesiastes. Sometimes Song of Songs or Song of Solomon is thrown in there as well. So each one of these books deals with God's wisdom to us for living and how we are to relate to him, to relate to our world in a good and godly and pleasant way. Each of these books deals with that. And the book of Proverbs, okay, uh, deals specifically with principles to live life. General principles, if we do these things, generally speaking, this will be the result. And so I want to point us to a key verse in each of these books to help us understand how they fit together. Now, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, many of us have these memorized. My mom made me memorize these verses when I was a kid, and I'm glad she did, but it kind of sums up in some way about what the book of Proverbs is all about. And it says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Submit, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. In the book of Proverbs, it gives a choice to the simple folks, okay, to the young, actually to the wise and discerning as well. If you listen to God's wisdom, the creator of the world, it will make you wiser and wiser still. But if you disregard God's wisdom, disregard God's word, that you will be a very foolish person. And in general, things will not go well for you. So, it, excuse me, so it, Proverbs deals with these things and gives us thing after thing and subject after subject and calling after calling to help equip us to live life in a Godward wise way. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes. Okay, and it actually it's one of my favorite Old Testament books. It's more of a philosophical book, and it deals with life um, it, uh, as well. And it deals with the exceptions that sometimes good things happen to bad people. Okay, now there are general rules which govern this world, but sometimes a foolish person gets a large inheritance. Sometimes the race is not always won by the fastest. Sometimes evil people get away with evil. And so Ecclesiastes addresses these philosophical, theological questions, and at times says meaningless, right? Meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And it's a fascinating read, looking from the the wisdom of Solomon, dealing with these exceptions to the general rules. And at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, he sums up all of his thoughts in a profound way. And this is what he says in chapter 12, verse 13. Now all has been heard, and here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. 
For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. So the conclusion is that God is supreme. And in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the book of Job, it deals with the providence and sovereignty of this creator God. And if we do what he says us to do, this is generally how it will turn out. But sometimes in existence, there seems to be exceptions to the rule. But it points us back to God's sovereignty, saying that in the end, we all must give an account. And nothing and no one will go beyond his sovereignty and go beyond his sight. And so that book of Ecclesiastes points us to what matters most, fearing God. And we'll see this in Proverbs next week. And following after him. Now, Job deals with another exception, where Ecclesiastes deals with the exception that good people, excuse me, bad people sometimes get good things. Job deals with the exception that bad things sometimes happen to good people people enter Job. And this book, again, is a fabulous book. And I would encourage you to read your Bible, okay? Have we talked about that in here before? Okay. Read your Bible, all right? Read the Old Testament. Read the New Testament. Allow God to read you with it. The book of Job is a fascinating read as you see Job and we got the prologue of what took place which Job was unaware of and these conversations with these friends and Job declaring his innocence and wrestling with what had taken place and what was happening in his life. And he said he wanted to question God. Just give me an audience with God and we can then work this out. Well, Job did indeed get an audience with God, and it went a little different than he anticipated. Where God said, sit down, Job, let's have a conversation. First, tell me, where were you when I created the stars and the heavens? Job, tell me where the snow is kept and how the rain works. And Job, tell me, can you wrestle with the Leviathan and these type of things? Now, at the end, this is Job 42 Here's Job's response. He says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that observes my plan without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you, Job, and you shall answer me. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. These three books together, as you read about God's Proverbs, in scripture, as you read about wisdom that we can gain in living life in a way that best honors him and goes in order of the grain of creation, so to speak, we learn. We learn from Ecclesiastes that not always do things turn out the way that they are supposed to turn out. But yet God is sovereign and providential in life. In Job, we learn that there's so much more going on to the story, right? Things that we are not capable of understanding. Things that we are completely unaware of. But God is not unaware of these things. God knows. God is working. God is great. And do you and do I trust him? When our life goes according to plan, or when our life goes off the rails, will you be willing to continue to trust God? That's a good question for us all. Because I can imagine there's, there's things in your life that haven't quite gone according to your plan. 
if we had a microphone, I'd say, hey, tell me, you know, when we go up to 18-year-olds at graduation, tell me your life plan, right? We should interview them when they're 88 years old and say, well, how did it go, right? God is still working with his wisdom, with his spirit, through it all. He continues to speak to us. He continues to reveal himself to us. And we have to ask, do we have eyes to see? Do we have ears to hear? Do we have faith to follow? And God invites us to follow him. Because we are not as smart and wise as we think we are. Right? But he is. Trust him. So now let's take a deeper dive into the book of Proverbs. And I uh, lifted a very helpful chart from our friends at Preaching Today. And they laid some things out. And you probably won't be able to read that at all. But it's in your notes, okay? So let me just give you a general overview, okay? So Proverbs, the first nine chapters. And we're going to spend most of our time in this series in the first nine chapters. It talks about becoming a person who loves wisdom. You'll see in this a father talking to a son, a mother, lady wisdom, talking to the simple. And there's this dialogue and there's this pleading for us to listen to wisdom. And they expound to us wisdom for our life. If we put into play and practice, it will guide us and serve us well. Now, in the middle of the book, there are 375 proverbs of King Solomon, and they're generally two lines that are put together dealing with all kinds of subjects, from relationships to business to leadership to money to on and on and on subjects. So chapters 10 through 22 deal with these proverbs, these wise sayings for us to think about, to ponder, and to employ. That's the main middle section of the book. And then from 22 all the way to the end of it, it's an assorted collection of wisdom. Primarily, the the Proverbs are of Solomon, but near the end, we get 30 sayings of the wise, more sayings, Proverbs from Hezekiah, and a few others listed there. So that, in essence, is the book and how it is divided into three main sections for us to learn from, to listen, and be formed. Now, a proverb is a comparison designed to make you ponder. We have to be careful if we make proverbs into promises, okay? Now, we have many promises in Scripture, and We are to hang on to them. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am going to return and come again, okay? If you believe in me, you will not be separate from me. And there's so many promises we can hold on to. Proverbs are general principles that ultimately, yes, are true. But again, sometimes there's exceptions to the rules. So Proverbs are helpful in helping us understand God's design and to apply wisdom to our life, making the simple wise, or if people shun God's word, they become like a fool or become like the scoffer. And you and I and people in all time have these choices. And a primary theme in the book of Proverbs is the fear of the Lord. And we are going to take a look at that next week as it comes up in chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or the beginning of wisdom. And we're going to take a deep dive into that next week because it is an important aspect for us to understand. So this morning, we're going to talk about more of the backstory. We're going to accomplish a verse today, right? We're going to get a verse under our belt, but it's an important verse for us to understand what's going on. Proverbs 1, verse 1. Hear, 
it is. Okay, if you have a Bible, open it up. We're going to talk about one verse, but then we're going to go to the backstory, and you're going to need to look up a few passages as well. This is Proverbs 1 1. This is how it starts. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Stop. Okay. Who's Solomon? Who's David? What king are we talking about? Well, if you were a good Hebrew boy or girl, you knew these stories well. Because the Old Testament gives us a lot of information about this famous king named David. And David they, uh, received promises from God. There was a covenant, of course, made to Abraham, and there was a covenant renewed to this one named David. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promises to him, it says, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is a massive promise to this one named David. And also he told him that your son will sit on your throne. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. Psalm 132. So David knew of these promises. And those in the kingdom knew of these promises. But they did not know how they were going to be fulfilled. Unfortunately, David had many wives, and from these wives he had many sons. And so there was this tension and this anticipation as David was nearing the end and his kingdom and it was coming to a close, who was going to be the next son in line. And so as David was getting close to the end, there was tension. And one of David's sons reared up and declared himself the king. And you can read it. And David became aware of this. And he called for his wife Bathsheba. Now, of all of the wives and all of the children, Bathsheba? <laughs> if I was David, or if I was God, I would have probably just kind of let that fade from memory, right? Bathsheba Gate. You guys remember that? Right? It was not one of David's finest moments, right? Not being where he should have been, peering over the side of his castle and committing adultery and murder. If you were David, would you not select perhaps another son? Bathsheba? Really? Yeah, Bathsheba. Why? Why Bathsheba? Because God delights in redemption. Because God is a God of mercy. God is a God of restoration. That's why this young man was selected. So the first point that I want you to think about, and we're going to look into Solomon's calling his story and wrestle with the question, what does it take to become wise? Who are we to be when we're reading these scriptures? What does it take to observe and to participate and to receive and to live out the wisdom of God? The first thing that it requires is God's mercy. So number one, receive the mercy of God. You are not as strong or smart or noble or authoritarian than you think you are. 
In order to become wise, we must recognize we are in desperate need of the mercy of God. So we read a little bit about this young man, Solomon, and we find out some things about him as we read the backstory. And here is the mercy. After David committed this horrendous, Sin against God primarily, against Bathsheba personally, against her husband. The child from that incident died. The scandal was broken. David's kingdom was never the same. But we read in 2 Samuel 12, Verse 24, and David comforted his wife, Bathsheba. He didn't marry her. He went to her and they were together. They gave birth to a son and they named him Solomon. Now look at this next verse. The Lord loved him. Don't you like the redemption of God? Before Solomon knew anything, the Lord loved him. Before you knew anything, the Lord loved you. He saw you. He knows your circumstances. He loved you first. The Lord loved him before he did anything. Out of a heartache and hardship of circumstance, the Lord And because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedediah. This is just probably a silly side note, but if you cut Jedediah down, you see something called a Jedi. Did that ring any bells? George Lucas, Star Wars, right? He's Jewish, by the way. It made me think, I wonder if this is where he came up with Jedi. No one cares about that. Okay, I just said it out loud, but I thought, you know, whatever. <laughs> Someone's going to have to look that up. Dave, you have vain imagination. Anyway, in order to become wise, we must receive the mercy of God. God gives mercy because he chooses to. <laughs> because he's merciful. That's why. God gives us love because he chooses to. He actually delights in choosing the lowly, the weak, the common, the foolish things of his kingdom for his purposes. So none of us would be given over to boasting about how great we are. See 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Aren't you glad for that? I qualify for this. Foolish. Despised. Not noble birth. Some backwater town. Divorced parents. Crooked teeth, knobby knees. You will never see me up here in shorts. I spare you. I bet you qualify too. Have hope in that. Recognize that we are all in need of the mercy of God. You come in at that point, you are a prime candidate for God's glory and his wisdom to shine through your vessel. Receive the mercy of God. And we love the one who first loved us. We love because he loved us first. 
You didn't find Jesus. Jesus found you. (laughs) He holds you fast. And so Solomon, being loved by God, and you being loved by God, receive his mercy and then embrace the love of God. So we see this about Solomon, and he was loved by God in very difficult and unfortunate and tragic circumstances, and he turned then and embraced the love of God. We read this in 1 Kings chapter 3, starting with verse 3. Solomon showed his love for the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord. He loved him, and it was evidenced by his life, the obedience of faith. How? By walking according to the instructions given him. The word of the Lord to his father, David. Jump said he offered sacrifices and burnt incenses, incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices. That was the most important high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. And we're going to be in 1 Kings 3 for a while, so if you haven't turned there, turn there. Okay. So Solomon, in response to the love of God, embraced his love by receiving God's love and responding and loving him in return. He worshipped God. So it's receiving the mercy of God, which is a prerequisite for being wise, and then embracing God's love. God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for reaching down to me, and I worship you in recognition of what you have done for me. And I choose in faith to follow in your instructions and follow in your footsteps And Solomon loved God by walking and worshiping and doing what he knew was good and right and just. Receive God's mercy, embrace his love, respond in worshiping him and following him. This is the stuff, the fertile ground where the seeds of wisdom can germinate and grow. If we have a hard heart against God, if we have a hard heart against his word and against our circumstances, the seeds of the word of God will bounce off. And our hardness will continue to become harder. Open your hearts to the sovereign and merciful and loving God, in so doing, we're a candidate of wisdom. Embrace the love of God. Now, as we see, and we continue to read this interaction, thirdly, we must understand our place. Understand your place where God has assigned you in his sovereign plan that he is unraveling for all time. Solomon understood. Now let's read a little bit about him. So here he is worshiping at Gibeon. And at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. Aren't you glad that God can speak while we're awake? And aren't you glad that God can speak when we are sleeping? God will communicate to us in a way that we can understand. And so God reached out to this king, and God said to him, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Now oh, there's a blank check. We like the stories of Aladdin with the genie bottle, right? Three wishes. God is greater than any genie. And he asked him a question. Ask me for whatever you want me to give you. If God asked you that question, how would you respond? I 
A lot of choices. Solomon literally had that question asked of him by the sovereign Lord. What what do you choose? Solomon answered. Now, pay attention. You, God, has shown great kindness to your servant. He responds first by acknowledging who God is and acknowledging God's kindness. God, you've shown great kindness to your servant, my father, David. He recognized God's goodness to his family. Because he was faithful to you, and righteous, and upright in heart. This is the son of an illicit relationship saying this about his father. Doesn't that kind of strike you a little bit? Why can he say this? Because this was David's general direction. But God's mercy and kindness filled in the gaps. David, of course, had consequences for his behavior, but his heart was indeed towards God, and he recognized God's faithfulness to David, his dad. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. He recognized that he was there not because of his own stature or his own attributes. He was there because the kindness and the goodness of God. You are here by the kindness and goodness of God. What you are, what you have, what you do is because of God's kindness and his goodness. And he acknowledged that and understood his place. Verse 7, now Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Does that sound like someone who's humble? 100%. He understood his place. He wasn't, now I'm king, now God make me great. He says, I'm your servant. And I am a servant. If you are called to follow Christ, you are to serve him and to serve other people. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's taking the low road. And Solomon understood his place. Do we not long for leaders who desire to be servants? Understand your place that first and foremost, you are where you are by the kindness of God. Second, that you are to serve him. Understand, and he says but I am only a little child. He was a grown man at this point. But he recognized because of the duty in front of him and the glory of God, he was but a little child. Sometimes we get so um, stoked on our own greatness because we compare ourselves with ourselves and we think that we're so much better than Look up a little higher, friend. Woe is me, for I've seen the Lord. Thank you, Job. In comparison to God's wisdom, you're pretty dumb. In comparison to God's grandeur, you're not that glorious. He recognized this. 
And we as people, the people of God, plead with you. Receive his mercy, embrace his love. Understand our place in comparison to the kindness and the goodness of God. This will give us fertile soil in which the seeds of wisdom can grow. God, help us to remove the thorns of pride and the hardness of deceit so that God's wisdom and word can bear fruit in our lives. And so, here is this king given this blank check by the God of the universe. And he starts by acknowledging his kindness. And he starts by saying that I'm your servant and I'm a small child. And then he turns to the task. And this is the next thing in becoming wise. Recognize your task. Your servant, verse 8 in 1 Kings 3 your servant is here among the people you have chosen. A great people, too numerous to count or number. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, what he's prepared in advance for you to do. You know that you have something to do here, right? Well, I'm 93. You still got something to do, right? The, the unemployment rate in the kingdom of God is zero. God has given you a task. And the task is bigger than you, and the task is beyond you. God does not ask us to do something that we can do alone. He asks us to do something that he can do through you. Solomon had a huge task. And the task God gives you is bigger than you. You don't have the strength to love your neighbor as yourself. You're loving, but you're not that loving. You don't have the patience to deal with the dog another day. We're watching my daughter's dog right now, by the way. It's personal for me. In our time of need is where we reach to God. Why do you think God gives us need? So that we call for him. It's an opportunity for intimacy. How do you like that? God, I need you. I need you. I can't do this. We can't. But if he calls you to something, he will give you what you need to do that thing. Solomon rec recognized his task, and it, you will not seek wisdom if you don't realize what God has asked you to do, and what he's asked you to do is bigger than you. God never asked you to do something that you can accomplish in your own strength. If you can accomplish it in your own strength, God probably hasn't called you to it. Think about that for a while. John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Bind in the branches. Next is this. Ask for what you need to do his will. That's a good prayer. It's a good place to circle. This is how Solomon responded. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to 
govern this great people of yours. Notice what he asked for. He asked to be given what he needs to accomplish what was asked. Out of love for the Lord and service to him. How many times have you prayed for things that are outside God's will? Every day, probably. It's a good reminder for us. God, would you give to me this day what I need to do your will? Here's your promise. He will answer that prayer. He will answer that prayer. And sometimes we don't even know what we need for the day. God, in the morning, God, will you give me what I need today? Will you give me all my daily bread today so that I can accomplish your will? What a great prayer. Pray that prayer. You want to become wise, understand your task. God, I need this from you. I need your mercy. I need your love. Help me to follow in your ways. I ask you for what I need. Here's God's response to Solomon. Verse 10. The Lord was pleased. Don't you like that? What a response. I'm just resting. The Lord was pleased. That Solomon asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life, or things we would ask for, wealth for yourself, nor you've asked for death of your enemies, but you asked for discernment, in administering justice, granted. I'll do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you and what you have not, what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my degrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. God, in his goodness, gives us more than we need and more than we deserve. Thank you for that response. In his goodness. He gives us not just what we need, but more than we need. And he gives us more than we deserve. That's why Paul writes to him who can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that's worked within us. To him be glory and the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Wisdom is from God, about God, and in God. It's in first and foremost about Him, and He invites us to receive and walk in it. He calls to us, and we're going to hear this. Wisdom calling and calling and calling. God is true to His promise to you. He is true to His promise to Solomon. And we read in chapter 4, God gave Solomon, verse 29, wisdom, very great insight. He was true. And a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand of the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East, greater than all the wisdom of Egypt, greater than all of the collected wisdom 
And God in his providence collected it for us that we could read it. Why would you skip this book? Why would you just kind of wash over it and go to other things that you kind of know about? You can read ahead for this sermon series. Listen, look, meditate. The wisdom of God? And you think you know better than him. Receive God's mercy and his love. Respond in humility and service. Ask for what you need. And God will provide what is needed and glorify himself through it and reward you with satisfaction. When you read in the New Testament, we read about this person called Jesus. Have you heard of him? One of his names is Jesus is the wisdom of God. Jesus himself is the source of all true wisdom and demonstrates this wisdom by how he interacted with us. The word became flesh and dwelled among us. Jesus, the very person of God. Jesus, the exact image of the Father, Jesus, the wisdom of God. If you want to see wisdom in action, look to the Son of God. How he lived, how he served, what he talked, how he interacted, and how he fulfilled his Father's calling on his life. And this same Jesus, sent by this same Father, gives us the same Spirit to walk among us now and to live within us. To illuminate His Word, to empower our service, to heighten our praise. 1 Corinthians 1.30 It's because of Him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us the wisdom of God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. God's wisdom before the creation of the world, the lamb that was slain so that you and I could be redeemed now, so that we can be with him and glorify him forever. God's sovereign plan that includes you, me, and us. And so this morning we are transitioning over to a time of communion and recognition.